One last thing that I did promise, I'm just gonna bring in the Thor hammer for you guys, it's Halloween. And we're gonna hammer these picks this weekend. Rah, boom. All right, AJ, we got it done. Hello and welcome to Monkey Knife Fights UFC Breakdown for UFC 267. What a card. We're joined today by AJ Shulo. First off, AJ, welcome to the show. Yeah, back-to-back pay-per-views. It starts this Saturday, man, with 267. Uh, Abu Dhabi, we got an earlier start time for those of you in the U.S. Two title fights at stake and a loaded card. We've got a six-fight main card, so a lot of stuff to dig into. Well, folks, also going on tonight is game two of the World Series. And don't forget, if you play a $20 MLB, $20 worth of MLB contests during any of the World Series games, you will get a free $5 sports ticket on Monkey Night Fight at the conclusion of the World Series. But let's get into this main event. Probably two of the nicest guys you'll ever see around the sport. Most respectful guys ever. Jan Blahovich, the whole time in the lead up for this fight, he's been saying how much he respects Glover Teixeira, even his last fight against Israel Adesanya. I think some people got to put a little more respect on his name. Jan Blahovich, man, he is the real deal. And when I look at this fight play out, I think he's got better jujitsu. I think he's a better striker. And we've seen him uh, regionally get Muay Thai titles and Jiu-Jitsu titles. So I really am leaning towards Jan Blahovich. I just think he's a better, younger, stronger, faster version of Glover Teixeira. Glover Teixeira, obviously, second title fight. Um, lost to John Jones seven years ago. Back in there would be a great story. As far as it pertains to Monkey Knight fight, I think these two guys are as tough as nails. Glover's really sharpened up his boxing, and he's shown that he can eat some punches. But that Polish power... I don't think he can take 108 shots of that Polish power to the head. Uh, and if, if, if Jan Blachowicz wants to tee up on him, it could be a long night. But I do think Glover survives into the championship round. So I'm taking the, the more and the more on the monkey knife fight strike line. But I think Jan Blachowicz and the Polish power will be too much in the later rounds for Glover to share. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, we see it a little bit differently in terms of the MKF uh, side. But in terms of the matchup, we agree 100%. Um, yeah, Jan, uh, the thing I am worried about is his takedown offense. He hasn't really been tested there a whole lot in recent years. The last time I really saw him taken down was by Krelov back in 2018. I didn't like how he was defending there. He got taken down easily from a single leg. And uh, yeah, since then, I'm sure he's improved. But uh, again, Glover's a really good wrestler, man. Like you talk about top his nails, even when he's rocked, he'll get the double leg against the fence and then just dump you. Um, so I'm a little bit worried about that on the Jan side, but as you mentioned, he's really good at jujitsu, a Brazilian jujitsu black belt. He could probably survive with Glover on the ground. Um, and Jan's uh, got the striking advantage in my opinion. He's more technical. He's more durable. I think the counters will be there for him. Glover, he's a solid boxer, but he throws like the same combination over and over again, uh, making him very, very predictable. And honestly, I think that gets him a knockout loss early. You know, Glover has been almost knocked out in several recent fights. Iwan Kujalaba. You know, Carl Roberson, uh, Anthony Smith was getting teed off on there. Tiago Santos most recently. I think this is the fight where it finally catches up with them, unfortunately. I know he's as tough as nails, but uh, I think the countering opportunities will be there for Jan, and I think Jan probably gets a knockout early. So I'm going to actually go with less and less on both guys. I know that they're both tough, but at the same time, I think this is the the chance where, um, you know, Jan gets the knockout here in the round one. Yeah, for me, I think it's just, I think when Glover gets a little sloppier with his striking, it's going to be one of those counters, as you mentioned, just a counter uppercut from from Poland all the way up to Glover's chin. And and I think that's just going to end it. I could see it being ended early. As you said, Glover's chin, he, he has proven that he likes, that he is good at surviving. As you said, against Anthony Smith, he was able to survive that. He was also able to survive for a bit against Alexander Gustafsson. But one big difference there is that Jan Blachowicz is a very highly, like high IQ in his fighting game. And he's a very smart finisher. If you watch those fights when they went to go in to finish Glover, even Diego Santos, it was all these King Kong hammer fists. Jan Blachowicz is a killer. He picks his shots. When you watch that Dominic Reyes fight, he gets over him and goes pop, 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 and that's it. I think if it gets into one of those situations, uh, I'm with you that, that it'll end quick. It's just... I think they'll both respect each other enough to give a little pitter-patter from the outside for the first few rounds. And then once uh, Glover tires down a bit, I think Jan will put the pay- keep that pace on him like we saw against Israel Asanya, the takedowns in the fifth round. I don't think he will take it down, but put that pace on and get the knockout finish. AJ, you like the knockout finish. Are there any other? Is there any path to victory for the good guy Glover to share in this fight? Yeah, I think for him to win, he has to get takedowns in earned control time. 
Um, that has been the whole of Blahovitz's game. Even when you want to go back to this recent run that he was on, pretty much every single fight that he lost was because he got taken down and held down. I know he, he lost to San, uh, Santos. That was the most recent one. That's the exception. But going back to Patrick Cummings, got taken down three times, controlled for seven minutes, uh, almost eight minutes there. Alexander Gustafsson, competitive on the feet, but Gustafsson took him down four times, controlled him for 10 minutes. Uh, Corey Anderson, same type of deal, took him down, controlled him. So, like, that would be Glover's path to victory. And we've seen him execute it time and time again. So, despite a, a big underdog price on him, he's got a viable path to victory. So, I, I don't – yeah, I don't see this fight as a squash match, even though I'm predicting Jan to win by early knockout doesn't mean I, I can't see Teixeira, you know, winning and, and do so doing so rather uh, convincingly as well. So, yeah, I think it's a pretty binary fight on the feet. Jan should have his way. But if Glover gets takedowns or in his top position, he should have his way. Yeah, I'm just really excited to watch a title fight between two guys that that have really paid their dues across the UFC and the mixed martial arts community. Obviously, Glover Teixeira had one of the most anticipated UFC debuts ever when he finally came over in the early 2010s. I think it was 2011 or 2012. After what was it, a five or six year visa delay, the UFC has been trying to get this guy in forever. He's fighting for his second belt. It would be a great story, but I'm with you, AJ. The Polish power will reign supreme on Saturday night. And I, I think he defends the title for the first time against a true 205er. And then we get some interesting matchups come down the line, whether it be Alexander Rakic or Yuri Proshka. Um, moving into the Bantamweight Championship now, another title fight. AJ, as we go through this, I'm just going to get more and more excited as we inch ever closer and closer and closer. It's Piotr Jan versus Corey Sandhagen. Sandhagen obviously lost that fight to TJ Dillashaw. One important thing for me was he wasn't able to get that finish against Dillashaw, who to me was rather chinny in previous years. Well, he does have the better movement, and I think he's got the better stand-up striking. It's just the way that Piotr Jan defends himself in that tight turtled shell. I don't see any of those wilder Sandhagen kicks in those strikes landing to the body or the head. I think in that shell that Piotr Jan will get it and then just slowly put his pace on him, start taking Sandhagen down. And one thing that I really want to note is that Sandhagen gives up his back so much when he is scrambling. If you give up your back to Piotr Jan, you are going to sleep. I just, uh, this is a tough one for me. I'm going to go less and less because I think Piotr Jan gets a hold of Sandhagen's back when Sandhagen gets to scrambling in that second round. And I think Piotr Jan's boxing is too tight. And I think his ground game and his submission game is too strong for Corey Sandhagen. Yeah, that's fair. I'm going to actually slightly disagree though. I do like Sandhagen in the matchup. I think that he's the better striker at distance. I think his footwork is superior. He's a bit longer as well. Um, Jan, like you said, he does put himself in that defensive shell. Um, but the thing is, even though those, those strikes might not be connecting with the most impact, that doesn't mean that the stat provider won't, won't count them. Uh, that's the way I look at it. So I think that the points you made are very valid. I think that Jan will be, uh, you could argue he's going to be landing cleaner and harder, uh, but it's going to be more so like power versus uh, attrition on the Sanhagen side, power on the Jan side. Um, I do see this fight playing out. They're both very durable historically. I know you said that Sanhagen gives up his back. That's a concern. Jan, to me, he's really strong as a grappler, but the thing is he doesn't really look to grapple all that often. I think he wants to strike. Maybe all of a sudden he wants to wrestle because he sees that that's been um, an issue in Sanhagen's game. I just, I would like to see it more before I like predict Jan to go out there and take him, try and take him down as many times as say even Dillashaw did. Um, so I see, I think we've seen an extended fight here fight projects to go that way where I think both guys are capable of landing in high volume. You know, Piotr Jan lands 5.99 significant strikes per minute, Corey Sanhagen 6.32. Um, and as you mentioned, there could be some grappling here, pitter patter strikes in the clinch. Uh, Jan is, is comfortable there at times. Like we saw against Serling uh, Sanhagen is active from his back. He'll look to scramble uh, with, you know, he'll go for submissions from his back heel hooks. He'll look to Grammy roll. Um, so I, I tend to think we get a high pace fight between two very high level fighters um, I understand the love for Jan, uh, but I think for him to win, he's going to have to do enough damage on the feet to, you know, knock Sanhagen down, convincing the judges that he won or take him down enough times and control him, uh, kind of like Dillashaw did. But I think that the better volume and distance striking will go to Sanhagen. So um, I'm actually going to side with him here. I'm going to go with the more and more. The big underdog pick in Corey Sanhagen. I love the Sandman. I'm, I'm cheering for him. But when I watched that Piotr Jan fight against Aljo, he was so patient and just took his shots and started to pour it on. And the fact that Sandhagen could not get Dillashaw out of there, yes, he knocked out Marais, but 
how chinny is Marais these days. Yes, he uh, he had another knockout right before that against another opponent who, who's fairly chinny. I just I don't see Sandhagen Sandhagen penetrating the Piotr Jan shell. I think those counters are going to be big, and I think if he does get him a hold of him, it could be a, as I said a really tough night for Corey Sandhagen on the back. So we're going clashing with the first two picks. Always keeping things interesting here on Monkey Knife Fight. What was the I? I analysis beautiful as always my friends but the, what was it the uh, aj aj's riding with the the more and the more sees the fight playing out okay. and i just think the explosive i think Corey sanhagen's gonna dance around get a bunch land a bunch of strikes early but uh try to start opening up and finding very little success and the piotr young catches one of those kicks and gets to the ground in his back i i just i gotta take the less i just think piotr young's a killer um Still and best friends, that's but that's okay yeah, we're, we are still best friends. We're just disagreeing today, folks. But uh, the next fight is one that I really want to pick your brain. Dan Hooker, you just got to give props to Dan Hooker right off the bat. I mean, taking this fight, you can see the quote uh, it, that Jason provided us. I, I don't want to say yes, and then the missus finds out, and we're moving countries. That's what he told ESPN. Uh, he said he bought a do- off this contract and off the, being able to take this fight. He said he bought his daughter a house and that she'll be able to forgive him uh, down the line for not being there for a few months. So Dan Hooker is feeling pretty good about himself. And man, I think if Dan Hooker has a full training camp against guys like purebred wrestlers like Islam Makashev, then Hooker can control that, control the range, land some knees, but doesn't have a full training camp, doesn't have the best best guys in the world to bring in. Uh, what I just... There's too many question marks around Dan Hooker in this fight for me. I think Makashev can get him to the ground and start pounding him out uh, in the later round. So I'm actually going to take the more and more on this because I don't think Hooker is going to fatigue. I think he could win the first round uh, while Makashev tries to find those takedowns and Hooker keeps him at bay with some great striking. But uh, I'm going to go with the more and more on this one. And I like Islam Makashev, unfortunately. Although for two straight fights, I'm cheering against my own pick, which always makes things exciting come Saturday night. Yeah, as you mentioned, like Hooker by far is the most proven fighter like that Makashev has faced. Uh, not the best fighter, in my opinion, because I actually think Armin Tarukian is a stud and potential future champion, but more, more certainly the most proven fighter is Hooker. Um, and he could theoretically knock Makashev out on the feet. We've seen Makashev knocked out. Um, he did, you know, buckle from a jab there from uh, Davi Hamos. Uh, but the thing with Makashev is he's so good defensively, absorbs 0.77 significant strikes per minute with 70% defense. That is super impressive, man. And um, there, there is some merit to maybe those stats are a bit, uh, you know, not accurate to the style that Hooker brings. Hooker's longer, five inches of reach, a couple inches taller, just a better striker at range. Um, but nonetheless, the point still stands. Islam doesn't like to throw in combination a lot because he likes to slip out of way, close distance effectively, and get the fight to the ground. And uh, until I see uh, just somebody stuff Islam, I, I'm just going to assume they can't stop his takedowns. Hooker's actually a pretty strong defensive wrestler. Uh, and he controls range well, but he was taken down easily by Poirier. He has been taken down in the past by or that by wrestlers that aren't anywhere near on Islam's level. So I don't see why Islam can't get the fight to the ground from there. Uh, he is active with his ground and pound, you know, against Thiago Moises, landed 148 total strikes, 61 of which were significant. Drew Dober, a fight that lasted a little over three rounds, 15 significant strikes, but 102 total strikes there. I think that we see Makashev go over uh, his uh, monkey knife fight total there. But I actually think we see Hooker go under because it's going to be tough for him to land at will against Makashev on the feet. And even if he does land on Makashev, you could potentially get a knock out there, in which case the less would cash even more, but more so what I'm investing into here, Hooker gets put on his back, struggles to work back up. Uh, and as a result, he just doesn't meet his threshold there. So um, like I said, there's some, there's some risk with Makashev here, you know, again, Hooker's a better striker, especially at range, but I think that ultimately Makashev will be able to control where the fight goes and then have his way, which is why I think he's rightfully favored. Um, well, one thing to think about there, I just, is the Makashev, like, I agree, I'm sold on his wrestling, but the level of opponents face, like Dan Hooker would eat some of the guys that Islam Makashev has fought and taken three rounds, like eat them out and chew them out in five minutes. And I think Hooker's going to be able to use his range early and get a lot of strikes out in that first round because I think that's what, as you alluded to, his path to victory is a knockout. And the best thing that we've seen Dan Hooker is those combinations when he gets you against the cage. He puts his head into your chest 
and he just starts throwing hands. And it's so awesome to watch. It's so entertaining. And I think he can bring that pace in the first round. And that's why I like the more and the more. I'm completely with you on the Makashev side. Um, yeah, the pitter-patter strikes on the ground and pound. I think Hooker will be punching up because I don't know how he'll get up. And I know a lot of analysts are looking at the Nate Hasprak fight and going, well, Hasprak, he took the Hooker took down Hasprak. Uh, Hasprak and Makashev are not on the same level, uh, level of wrestling, like not even remotely close. So do not use that as, oh, Dan Hooker can hang with Makashev on the ground because uh, he won't. I have Daniel Hooker winning the first round, using the strikes with the more, and then Makashev putting the pace on for rounds two and three, and Hooker, as you said, AJ, on his back. Now, also another thing, a lot of people, because Jason just put this in our chats, think that Habib is undefeated as a coach. He's actually not. He's been in the corner before as, as when he was actually active in the UFC and lost like his first three fights he cornered for. So there's a, there's a fun fact for all you kids at home. You can look it up because yeah, that's one of my favorite things to just, um, Habib's a great fighter. Don't get me wrong, but, uh, he's not an undefeated coach folks. Sorry, Habib fans, but, but, uh, straight facts coming at you. And here's a few more straight facts coming at you folks. Monkey knife fight, $2,500 in the KO King prize pool, minimum $5 entry. So you select three fighters to get all three knockouts on a minimum $5 entry. If all three of them do it, you're in to win your share of $2,500. I think Jan Blachowicz is a pick that both of us like there based on our breakdowns. Um, yeah, the Polish power reigns supreme on Saturday night. I, I love that pick. AJ, who do you like up next? I'm going to go with Magomed Ankalaev. Um, he's taking on Volkan Ustamir, who has been knocked out in uh, two. It, yeah, you're good. Uh, in two of his four UFC losses, right? And he's coming off of a, a brutal one against Prochaska. Yeah. Um, I think that Ankalaev here has technical advantages both on the feet and on the ground. Uh, and a good thing for Ankalaev and all of his finished wins throughout his career, he's been by knockout, never by submission. So I think we see the trend continue here. If he wins by finish, I think it's probably by a knockout on feet standing, he catches Ozdemir with a counter or takes him down and just uh, ground and pounds him here. Yeah, I'm completely with you on that one. That was actually my that was my second pick, and they're both actually on the main card, which is always fun uh, to look at. But another pick from the main card, uh, I like Alexander Volkov. Marcin Tabora, I don't think he'll be able to hang with Volkov. I, he's going to try and get in tight, and we see what Volkov – he's got good – defense and the takedowns i think he's going to be able to stay standing up against the cage and just pour it on tybora as the fight goes on volkov's got excellent excellent cardio for that size so i like volkov on the main card and if we shift to the the prelims there's another fight there that uh, that i had my eye on and it's laron murphy because maquan americani is not um i don't think he's ufc caliber and i think laron murphy is a uh, laron murphy pardon me is a killer so that would be a pick for the undercard, but those are my three picks on the main card right there, folks. Yeah, yeah I like I like the Volkov one, especially because like Tybora, he just doesn't take damage as well these days. Like uh, I know he's been on this recent run, but like uh, Sakai knocked him out quickly after Himov. It just seemed it seemed like his durability went on the downswing after Lewis knocked him out, and then you know even in his recent wins, like he's getting you know tuned up early. Like Greg Hardy's lighting him up in round one. Walt Harris, same thing. Even Ben Rothwell, like. There's definitely opportunity here. There's credence to Volkov having a good round one, and in turn, that could mean a knockout. Um, I like it. My third pick is actually going to be Kamzat Shemaev, though, the long-awaited return. Um, there is some risk with him. Obviously, he's, he's coming in here on a big layoff. He had a, a serious battle with COVID uh, to the point where he had a hole in his neck, and he was contemplating retiring from the sport altogether, which is crazy to think about. Uh, but he's facing Li Jing Liang, who is obviously just like the Hooker Makashev matchup, the, the most proven guy by far that he's faced throughout his UFC career. But one thing that I noticed about Li is despite the fact that he's ever been knocked out, he gets rocked often in fights, going way back to the early part of his UFC career against Bobby Nash, Dache Abi, like it, pretty much every recent fight of Lee, he gets rocked in. And Shmaev hits really hard, and he could finish Lee on the ground as well. Uh, we saw Lee get mounted by Neil Magny, get his back taken a couple of fights ago. You don't want to do that against a guy in Shemai, who's a very dominant wrestler and grappler, and is going to have a size advantage here. A guy that has fought a middleweight. He's going to be two inches taller, four inches of reach. I think this is Shemaev all day. Uh, I'm all aboard this hype train. Yeah, Hazmat Shemaev, just to talk about him for a minute, that rise that he had in that run, just so many quick turnaround fights. And then for him to be off for a year, 
this is really going to be a test for all the, I think all the fans of Hazmat Shemaev and, and him himself it truly will be a test. But one thing that scared me was when he was being interviewed, I think it was with uh, ESPN earlier this week. He's like, I hope to log some cage time. He hopes that this fight gets dragged out a little bit. Like that is one of the scariest things that you could ever hear from a guy like Hazmat Shemaev that has the ability I don't think his striking is that technical, but we've seen him knock. I forgot what fight it was, but he just threw out like a feeler jab and the guy crumbled like a lawn chair. Like Hasmat Shemaev is a scary dude. I think Lee has a path to victory with the quick knockout. But after that, I agree with you. I've seen him get rocked and I've actually seen him slow down. And if he starts slowing down against Hasmat Shemaev, it's, it's over. It's so over. Another fight that I want to talk about on this card, just because it's one of my favorite picks on the card, is Amanda Hibas versus Ver, uh, Verena Jandaroba. Now, Jandaroba? I said that one right, right? Jandaroba? Nice. Jandaroba, yeah. Yeah, and it's Hibas, not Rebas. But uh, this fight, I like the more and the more um, in the striking department. I think these two ladies are going to stand on their feet. Hibas, obviously, she did lose to um, – she outstruck Mackenzie Dern – walked around the ring, Mar- 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 lost to Marina Rodriguez, pardon me, who I think is probably the most elite striker in that female division right now um, when it comes to just pure boxing. So I like the more and more in this fight. I think it gets drawn out. And I think both these girls um, have a fun showing, but I like Hibas to, to win this one on the judges' scorecard. Yeah, me too. I like the more and more, and I also like Hibas to win. Um, I think she's the more effective striker. Uh, they're both good judo and Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners, so I largely think they're going to negate each other uh, to some extent there. And uh, yeah, should be one or lost in the feet. Therefore, yeah, I like this fight to play out. I think they're both really tough. I know Rebas has been knocked out in both of her losses. However, Jenna Roba has, doesn't have a single win by knockout on her resume. So while it's possible she wins by knockout, the data doesn't suggest it's all that likely. So uh, I, I'm right with you there, buddy. I, I think we see the more and more cash here relatively easily as well. Yeah. And just back to that point. I mean, when one of those m- knockouts, like I can't stress this enough is Marina Rodriguez. Like look what she did to Mackenzie Dern and she was a massive underdog. We both, I think we both had Rodriguez winning that fight when we broke it down, but man, oh man, like I'm high on, I'm high on that fight. And uh, what is, is there any picks that you just want to take a look at AJ, any perfect picks that you were just like, Ooh, that catches my eye on monkey knife fight. Yeah, uh, well, so there's a fight between Eliza Zaleski Dos Santos and uh, Benoit Saint Denis. Uh, I believe it's posted on the site. Uh, it's a relatively new put together fight, but uh, anyway, I, I think Dos Santos should should handle uh, Saint Denis here. Uh, I think he's a much better fighter, more well rounded, obviously much more proven against the UFC newcomer. Um, he's coming in here after about a year and a half layoff and he is 34. So theoretically there's always this wonder of regression. There we go. Thank you, Jason. Um, however, just like Jessica Rose Clark versus Jocelyn Edwards last week, like that doesn't do it enough for me. Like I want to prioritize the style matchup. I want to prioritize the stuff, the stuff that we could actually quantify rather than just guessing as to what form he's going to show up in. Right. It just, it's just unnecessary stress. And so, uh, I like Dos Santos to roll, and I actually like this to go less and less because I think he just gets this d- thing done so early. There's such a massive skill discrepancy on the mat. I think Dos Santos takes the back, and I think he gets the rear naked choke. Wow. Okay, well, I, I got a counter for you because I have another fight on this card that I preview exactly the same. Um, Jason, could you take us to Hu Yazong versus Andre Petrovsky, please? Andre Petrovsky obviously was the tough champion, got in there after Brian Battle got hurt, got it done, fought in August. And one thing that I really like about is this quick turnaround time, because that tells me that he wasn't taking time off on the couch and he's an excellent grappler. And we saw his cardio at the very best the last time we saw him. So that cardio question is the only question and possibly the early knockout from a Huey Yazong, but Yazong has Yao Zong, pardon me, has awful grappling. I think Petrovsky takes him down. I like the less and less here. And I think a first round submission, like something nasty, like a triangle choker, an arm bar. Like Petrovsky is a world class jujitsu pra- uh, practitioner. And Yazong is just, well, not. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yazong, all four of the takedown attempts that he was faced with in the UFC, he got taken down and against Asker. And again, just like we talked about, it's all fine and good to think the guy's improved. I'm sure he has. But is it enough to stop the takedowns of Petrovsky? I lean no. Petrovsky has a wrestling background. He's dominant in top position with his ground and pound. And Petrovsky, the vast majority of his wins are, are in the first round via ground and pound. So I think conceptually what your take makes a ton of sense. 
Perfect. Well, we like the less and less on that one too, folks. And um, maybe a KO King finish there for uh, Petrovsky if you want to mix them in. AJ, any final thoughts, any final bets that you want to take a look at on Monkey Knife Fight before this unbelievable card? Yeah, just to quickly uh, touch up on, on one more fight be- before we head out of here. Well, firstly, I like to say that, you know, we're most likely going to be recapping this this awesome pay-per-view card afterwards. So the viewers, uh, please be sure to tune in then. Uh, Connor and I uh, will be most likely be on Twitter space. So please be sure to check us out. Uh, but one last fight that I'd like to touch on just from just a general perspective is um, the fight between Magomed Mustafa and Divir Ismagulov. Um, I think that Ismagulov is rightfully the favorite here. I think that Mustafaev is largely knockout, uh, uh, knockout in round one or bust. Uh, we have seen him slow down in the past. He defends takedowns at the rate of 23%. Ismagulov is another Russian fighter on this card who has a bright future, in my opinion. Um, and I think that we see him get his best win to date against Magomed Mustafaev, a guy that has been tested against guys like Kevin Lee, Brad Riddell. Uh, it's just one of the many incredible prelim fights. Um, looking forward to a, to a showcase about here. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I have Demir winning that one too. The guy's 23 and one. I mean, and he he pushes a pace in the UFC. Something to note that all four of his UFC appearances have have gone to decision. So I think it would be a great statement for him to get, go out there and get a finish. Now, AJ did say that we will be on after the fights, but we have to let you guys know that these fights start at 10 a.m. Eastern time. We're back in Abu Dhabi, back in Fight Island, where Jan Blahovich won his belt. He landed in there earlier this week and said he's back in his lucky place. That gives me a good feeling for that main event. I really like the Blahovich knockout, folks. The main card starts at 2 p.m. It's headlined by Blahovich and Glover Teixeira. AJ, any final thoughts of that fight card? Oh, it's going to be awesome, man. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, guys, please be sure to tune in. It, again, early start time, right? So early, you know, fights, fights at breakfast. If you're central time, if you're, you know, if you're West Coast time, you're going to be wake up a little earlier, 730 East Coast. You know, West Coast breakfast. time, honestly, West Coast time, knowing those guys, those kind of people, they might still be awake. Halloween night, the pre of the pre before Halloween, might just be rolling in, grabbing a nice carton of chocolate milk, popping on your couch, eating some Fruit Loops and having yourself a nice morning with some UFC prelims. And then you get to listen to us break it all down after. It can't be that bad a day. Yeah, what's better than that, right? So, uh, yeah, looking forward to the event, guys. Again, back-to-back pay-per-views, awesome time to be a fight fan, and uh, let's do this thing. One last thing that I did promise, I was just going to bring in the Thor hammer for you guys. It's Halloween. And we're going to hammer these picks this weekend. Ah, Boom. All right, AJ, we got it done. Thank you so much for joining us, folks, here on Monkey Night Fights UFC 267 Preview Show. That's AJ MMA. Find all his picks at AJMMABetting.com. Folks, I'm Connor Roundtree, and remember to hit it hard.